Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown, and right over there is Matthew Stockton. Hello, Matthew. I'm over here. You are over there. Wow. So it's gone from hot as Hades to winter. Snowed today. It is snowing right now. The snowflakes are gigantic. Disgusting. They won't stick, though. So big, dumb snowflakes. I don't like big, dumb snowflakes. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. On the morning of the 8th of July, 1917, 39-year-old Tom Thompson, a renowned Canadian painter and skilled outdoorsman, set off well-supplied for a day-long fishing excursion on Canoe Lake in Algonquin Provincial Park in Whitney, Ontario. A canoe later identified as Thompson's was found floating upturned in the lake only hours after his departure. When Tom did not return from his fishing trip the next day, his friends became concerned. Eight days after Thompson first set out, Dr. G.W. Goldwyn Howland, a cottager from Toronto, spotted Tom's bloated and decomposing body floating in the lake. An examination of the corpse uncovered a large bruise on the right side of his head. Blood had come out of his right ear. Thompson's death was quickly ruled an accident and no police investigation took place. Thompson was laid to rest in Mowat Cemetery near Canoe Lake where he died. However, Thompson's older brother George demanded the body be exhumed. Two days later, Thompson's grave was reopened, the casket removed, and he was reinterred on July 21st in the family plot beside the Leith Presbyterian Church. Officially, the matter was closed, but a mythology has grown up around Thompson's death. In the intervening 105 years since Thompson died, investigations by sleuths, amateur and professional, have come to various conflicting conclusions. Some agree with the initial findings that Thompson died as the result of an accidental drowning after hitting his head. Others, however, suggest that Tom Thompson was murdered. You're listening to Dark Poutine episode 244, What Happened to Tom Thompson? Much has been written about Tom Thompson. He is considered one of the most influential Canadian painters of the 20th century. Thompson's most popular works capture the warmth, grandeur, and beauty of the Canadian landscape and ooze his own deep and spiritual love of our country's natural surroundings. His later work has had a great influence on Canadian art. As with many artists, the period of recognition that Tom Thompson received while alive was brief, and he never did make a living from his art. 
He publicly exhibited his first painting in 1913 and was dead only three years later. His paintings like The Jack Pine and The West Wind have taken a prominent place in Canadian culture and are considered by many as some of the nation's most iconic works. During my research, I was surprised to find that although separated by 92 years, I share a birthday with Tom Thompson. Thomas John Thompson was born on August 5, 1877, at his family's small stone farmhouse in Claremont, Ontario. He was the sixth of ten children, six boys and four girls, born to John and Margaret Thompson. Tom was the third son. Two months after his birth, Tom's family moved to another farm they called Rose Hill. It was close to Leith, Ontario, near Owen Sound in the rural Georgian Bay region of Lake Huron. Like many Canadians, Tom's appreciation for the outdoors began as a child. Growing up in rural Ontario, he spent his time as a youth canoeing, fishing, or hunting with his friends or dad. He swam, boated in the bay, played football, and walked endlessly. Although he was sporty and otherwise active, at one point he was kept out of school for an entire year due to poor health. According to authors David Silcox and Harold Town, he was described as suffering from ailments, quote, variously described as weak lungs or inflammatory rheumatism, end quote. Not one to want to stay indoors anyway, Tom was encouraged to get lots of exercise and fresh air. He used this time to explore the region around his family's home. It is believed that these quiet solo forays into the woods and fields of his youth were integral to the formation of his great love of nature. Another figure, prominent in Thompson's deep appreciation for nature, was his grandmother's first cousin, Dr. William Brody. He lived from 1831 to 1909. Dr. Brody was a well-known entomologist, ornithologist, and botanist. Young Tom would visit the older man in Toronto and the two would go on long walks collecting specimens while Brody explained to the fascinated youngster the biology and science behind what they were observing and gathering. The arts, in various forms, played an important role in Tom Thompson's family home. His mother and father were both readers, and their appreciation of literature and mother's affinity for poetry was passed down to young Tom. According to Silcox and Town, quote, Thompson's mother kept a good library that contained many of the classics, though she tended to favor romantic writers, such as Sir Walter Scott. Thompson's later illustrations of quotations from Robert Burns' Rudyard Kipling, Maurice Maeterlinck, Henry Van Drake, Engelbert Humperdinck, and Ella Wheeler Wilcox are proof he followed his mother's inclinations, especially in his love for poetry, end quote. The family loved playing and listening to music, too. They all played some kind of musical instrument. Tom learned to play the violin and the cornet. He drummed, joining his brothers in a local band, and was known to be a proficient mandolin player. Tom also took singing lessons and was rumored to have had a nice voice. Hey, did you have any friends when you were young whose families were sort of like creative families this way? Um... I had a lot of friends whose families were musical, yeah. Okay. But uh, I didn't have any friends whose families were all into painting and drawing and stuff. I mean, I like to draw and I, I never really learned to paint, but uh, I was sort of attracted to friends who liked to draw as well. Right. But it wasn't much of a thing where I grew up. Other than music. I always found these families fascinating because my family is so not yeah. artistic. Yeah. Right? But my one friend Zoe, her father was actually a renowned Canadian artist. Oh, okay. And, you know, even like she eventually became a, she produces video games, which is creative in its own way, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, lots of, lots of different friends whose families were, you know, literally would read poetry after dinner to each other. Oh, gosh. Like yeah. I never had friends like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I figure on the East Coast, there's actually probably a lot of musical families. Very much so. Right? Like, get out something, start strumming and singing. One of my grandmother's cousins was a world fiddle champion. Okay. Yeah. So. Well, we had, like, long time ago, like, mm -hmm. great, great, great level. Yeah. Um, I had somebody in my family who was renowned uh, opera singer. Oh, wow. In the UK, yeah. Didn't, didn't, didn't pass down, though. No, <laughs> it clearly didn't because I've heard you sing. 
Reportedly, there were no other early definite signs of the talented artist that Tom Thompson would become. He did lots of sketches and drawings. Some of these made their way into his church hymn books, but everyone in the family seemed to love drawing and painting. Tom didn't stand out in that way, at least not in the early days. His sisters later recalled that the caricatures Tom drew were so poor they had a hard time figuring out who he meant to be drawing. It was not surprising to his family that he's known more for his landscapes. Tom didn't know what he wanted to do with himself after high school. Tom received an inheritance of $2,000 from his paternal grandfather in the late 1890s. Quite a sum for the time. Mr. Thompson Sr. left half his estate, about $20,000, and the other $20,000 to be divided among his ten grandchildren, payable to each of them on attainment of majority. There are conflicting reports about what Tom did with the money. Some say he was frugal, squirreling away the cash, while others say he blew all of it on frivolous extravagances. Afterward, Tom trained as a machinist and worked in an iron foundry owned by a family friend, but that lasted only a year. Tom did try three times to join the military to go fight in the Second Boer War in southern Africa between 1899 and 1902. Thompson was refused military service thanks to being flat-footed. Unable to fight, in 1901 he chose to go to Canada Business College, a school his two older brothers had attended, but he lasted only a few months there learning plain and ornamental penmanship and copper plate. After a quick trip to Winnipeg, Tom Thompson went to Seattle where his elder brother George and their cousin F.R. McLaren had founded the Acme Business School in Seattle, which had become the 11th largest business school in the United States. During his six months at his brother's business school, to make ends meet, Tom worked as an elevator operator at the old Diller Hotel in downtown Seattle. After school was done, Thomas worked at the Seattle graphic design company Maring and Ladd as a pen artist, draftsman, and etcher. There, he produced business cards, brochures, and posters, and three-color printing for various enterprises. As he was trained in calligraphy, he specialized in lettering, drawing and painting. His bosses often became frustrated with Tom as he'd go off brief and turn in creative work that was more to his liking than theirs. There are examples of some of Thompson's work from this time still existing, but as freelance work isn't often credited, it isn't clear whether Thompson did anything on the side. He also worked as an engraver at another company for a time in Seattle, but left in 1904 to return home. The rumor is that Thompson's drive to return home was not a business decision, but was due to being spurned by a girl he'd reportedly fallen in love with the summer before he came back to his parents' home in Canada. Tom had apparently proposed only to have the object of his affection laugh in his face. The woman, a writer named Alice Elliot Lambert, never married. In one piece of her creative writing, Lambert tells the story of a girl who refuses an artist's proposal and forever regrets her decision. The next seven years of Tom Thompson's life, between 1905 and 1912, took place in the big city, Toronto. He moved there in the summer of 1905. In his first gig in Toronto, Thompson worked as a photo engraver, making $11 a week. Around this time, although not well documented, it's believed that Tom Thompson studied briefly with William Cruikshank, a British artist who taught at the Ontario College of Art. If this is true, Cruikshank was likely Thompson's only formal art instructor. Tom spent his free time pursuing the things he'd grown up doing, reading poetry, going to musical concerts, as well as theatrical plays and musicals and sporting events like baseball. But he always loved the outdoors, taking as much time in it as he possibly could get. Tom was also a complicated person. He was seen as a people pleaser, putting the needs of others ahead of his own. Even when camping with able-bodied friends, Tom insisted he'd do all the heaviest lifting for the group. Although he was a good-natured, great friend seemingly to everyone, all the pressure he put on himself to give and not be of any trouble to anyone else led him to some personal dark spots. He repressed his anger, and it turned inward on him. He was sometimes quite moody. From Joan Murray's book, Tom Thompson, Design for a Canadian Hero. There was anger hidden inside, anger that could erupt. Thompson had strange antipathies, and the few people he did dislike he hated most cordially, wrote Ross, a contemporary of Thompson's. 
He was not at all diplomatic in concealing it either. And since he was sensitive, some people would even say overly so, he often got a chance to have his feelings hurt. Other clues to his personality can be found in the accounts of his brothers or friends such as Lauren Harris. They vividly recalled Thompson's fits of despondency. When he was discouraged, Tom would sit looking at a work of design or a painting on his easel and try to destroy it, smearing it with ash or breaking wooden matches to throw them at the wet paint surface, a repetitive action typical of inward rage. Other signs of his other signs of his repressed anger were his moods often up and down. To get away from his own or others' anger, he would walk away. Harris later recalled that during the winter at his shack in Toronto, Thompson would exercise at night by putting on snowshoes to tramp the length of Rosedale Ravine and out into the country. End quote. Why do artists always have uh, this sort of anguish inside, or often anyway? Uh, everyone that I know does. Every single artist that I know. They're either they're either massive depression or they have manic depressive states. Or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, I don't know, overly sensitive, things like that. I'm not anything like any of them. <laughs> do, do you... <laughs> not at all. No. <laughs> not at all. I do have my dark moods. No. Yes. You? Yes, my fits of despondency. <laughs> uh, although, you know, we we spoke earlier, I don't see myself as an artist on anywhere near the level of Tom Thompson and his contemporaries. However... I agree. But... <laughs> Go shit in your ass. <laughs> anyway, there are, you know, I do creative things for a living. And and interestingly, I am one of these people who suffer in this way. Mm. Hmm. Funny. Yeah, it, it seems to be a, yeah. a theme. I think maybe sort of the inner turmoil mm. helps create or or it's a way to express it. I think so too. Right. And And... Expression also helps to alleviate the inner turmoil for me. Yeah, you like get it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, you look at some of the greatest works of, of fiction are really tortured things. Like I, I've talked about Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment a number mm. of times. You look at that and the main character in that is one of the most tortured people that I've ever read about. Yeah. Yeah. It happens that sort of on a, on a mass level as well, if you think of um, black arts and black artists out of the United States, mm -hmm. uh, you know, jazz, so much of, of rap and hip hop is fantastic pretty... stuff came out of, yeah. uh, out of the, the pain of society. Right? Yeah. We're not going to talk about Kanye though. That clown. Nope. From his early days, Tom Thompson was notoriously absent minded and forgetful. In yet another passage in Joan Murray's book, she relates the story of a childhood friend of Thompson's. The friend claimed that one day Tom's mother, Margaret, had sent Tom out to feed the hens with a pan full of potato peels. Instead of feeding the hens, Tom, lost in thought, had wandered into Owen Sound a few kilometers away. A friend spotted Tom there, who seemed oblivious to the pan of potato peels that he still carried under his arm. It is widely reported that Tom Thompson appreciated the finer things in life. He was practical when it came to art supplies, but the rest of his cash went on extravagances. According to Silcox in town, quote, he favored dressy silk shirts, good pipes, and Hudson's Bay tobacco. He told one of his sisters he loved the elegance of George S. McConkie's restaurant in Toronto, end quote. In 1908 or 1909, Thompson joined a Toronto firm called Grip Limited. They specialized in design and lettering work. It was a coveted gig in design circles as Grip was the leading graphic design company in the country and they were responsible for introducing Art Nouveau, metal engraving, and the four-colored process to Canada. The senior artist at Grip, J.E.H. MacDonald, encouraged his staff to paint outside in their spare time to better hone their skills. It was at Grip that many of the eventual members of the Group of Seven would meet. He died before they were called by their popular handle. Although the Group of Seven was not founded until after his death, his work was sympathetic to that of group members A.Y. Jackson, Frederick Varley, and Arthur Lismer. These artists shared an appreciation for rugged, unkempt, natural scenery and all used broad brushstrokes and a liberal application of paint to capture the beauty and color of the Ontario landscape. 
the name Group of Seven isn't as ominous as it sounds. There was no crime involved. From the Group of Seven.ca. Also, sometimes known as the Algonquin School, the Group of Seven was a group of Canadian landscape painters from 1920 to 1933, originally consisting of Franklin Carmichael, Lauren Harris, A.Y. Jackson, Frank Johnston, Arthur Lismer, J.E.H. MacDonald, and Frederick Varley. Later, A.J. Casson was invited to join in 1926, Edwin Holgate became a member in 1930, and Lemoyne Fitzgerald joined in 1932. Two artists commonly associated with the group are Tom Thompson and Emily Carr. Although he died before its official formation, Thompson had a significant influence on the group. In an essay, Harris wrote that Thompson was a, quote, part of the movement before we pinned a label on it. Thompson's paintings, The West Wind and The Jack Pine, are two of the group's most iconic pieces. Emily Carr was also closely associated with the group, though never an official member. Believing that a distinct Canadian art could be developed through direct contact with nature, the group is best known for its paintings inspired by the Canadian landscape and initiated the first major Canadian national art movement. By the early 1930s, the group's art was popular around the world. Many Canadian artists started to feel the National Gallery of Canada exhibited favoritism for the group's work, and they were the only Canadian artists to receive global recognition. Concern over the gallery's potential bias and exclusion of modern artists led to the formation of the Canadian Group of Painters in February 1933, end quote. The Group of Seven had good PR. Yeah. Actually, a lot of them worked in advertising. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is why I kind of wanted to tackle this particular topic with you, because I knew that you would have some input on it in this way. Yeah, and e even better, we're going to have somebody on the phone in the after show. Mm-hmm. Who, a friend of mine who's a professor of art yeah who actually just today was taking a bunch of students to go see a group of seven exhibition there you go or exhibit rather but yeah i mean they were they all most of them worked in advertising right mm -hmm. um their work's gorgeous right and you know as a kid like when i see it there's this sort of almost inner nostalgia for a time that I did, like I wasn't even born at that time, but there's yeah. this, it creates this sort of nostalgia and yearning for that time as a Canadian. It's they it's sort of like part of the Canadian soul. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I absolutely do. And um, Lauren Harris was actually my favorite of the group of seven. Why is that? Um, because it's just he has such a different style. Like um, the mountains, it's 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 more deconstructed somehow. Mm -hmm. um, but. The first time I actually saw a Group of Seven work was at the Dulwich Picture Gallery in London, actually. I hadn't seen a real Group of Seven painting until I was in the UK because there was a bit of a tour going on. Mm -hmm. But what I find interesting is, you know, there's another group of artists called the Beaver Hall Group. The Beaver Hall Group. Yeah, and many haven't heard of this group at all, and I actually like their work a lot better. Hmm. And I think part partly uh, it was mostly women. Oh, and that's interesting. Probably why um, right. it's not as famous. Right. right. But I mean, there, there was a, a woman connected to the group of seven in the form of uh, Emily Carr, but she was not an official member, which is interesting as well. Did you know that I did the, um, my friend uh, George and I did the rebrand of Emily Carr University when it moved? No, I didn't know that. Yeah. And they actually liked what we did so much that they took the colors of the brand identity that we did for them and put them on the, put it on the building. Cool. Yeah. Well, there you go. So that there's a little bit about Canadian art and yes. something about Matthew that I didn't know. It was in Algonquin Park where Thompson eventually died that while on camping and fishing excursions, he was inspired and painted some of his most famous landscapes. Algonquin Provincial Park is a provincial park located between Georgian Bay and the Ottawa River in Ontario mostly within the unorganized south part of the Nipissing District. Established in 1893, it is the oldest provincial park in Canada. Additions since its creation have increased the park to its current size of about 7,653 square kilometers. The park is contiguous with several smaller administratively separate provincial parks that protect important rivers in the area, resulting in a larger total protected area. It's a big park. It is a really big park, apparently, but I've never been. And it's not like a 
Park, like Hyde Park, or the yeah, the, it, with with play equipment. It's it's wilderness. It's proper wilderness. So you've never been? No, I've never been. So you've been a few times? Yeah, we used to go a lot when I was a kid. Okay. Like one time, I remember we were caught in a tornado in a canoe. A tornado in a canoe. A tornado was going through. It wasn't. We didn't see the funnel, but it was. It was nearby, and all I can remember is my mother bailing the canoe out while my father was paddling to try to get us back. Oh wow! In time. So did you camp at like proper campgrounds, or did you go like no. out into the? We you... went, We never did campgrounds when I was young. We we got in canoes and went into the wilderness and found a spot and pitched tents. That is awesome. That's how I grew up. Yeah, I didn't grow up that way. Yep, completely, com- <laughs> can, completely in the wilderness. That's how we. That's how I grew up. I can't picture Ted and Mary and Brown uh, wanting to do that in any way, shape, or form. It yeah. was hard enough for us to have like a tent put up at Rissard's Beach at the campground. We made our own canoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> that's not my experience at all. <laughs> like roughing it is like, oh, okay, there's no Wi-Fi. <laughs> There wasn't Wi-Fi in the 70s and 80s. I know, but you know. Although Thompson loved art his entire life, Tom Thompson's serious painting didn't begin until he was in his mid-30s. Proof that it's never too late to start. He did all his serious work between 1912 and 1917, and most of his larger pieces came between 1916 and 1917. From the CanadianEncyclopedia.ca To develop his first major painting, Northern Lake in 1913, Thompson selected one of the sketches from his trip to Algonquin Park and transformed it into a picture with greater depth in the foreground. Northern Lake is now in the permanent collection of the Art Gallery of Ontario. This method of working from an on-the-spot sketch to a finished studio painting became his common practice. These two ways of working reveal contrasting sides of Thompson's artistic personality. The sketch, with its vivacity and on-the-spot reportage, recalls the spontaneity of a lyric poem. The canvas created in the studio, with effects adapted from such styles as Art Nouveau and Post-Impressionism, is akin to an epic poem. Thompson first publicly exhibited Northern Lake in March 1913, selling his painting to the Ontario government for $250, equivalent of around $6,000 today Canadian. The sale afforded him time to paint and sketch throughout the summer and fall of 1913. There were patronages and grants that sustained him, but as mentioned previously, Thompson was never able to properly support himself through the sale of his paintings. Although Tom Thompson often went off on nature trips with friends, he was also drawn towards solitude, which is where he did his best work. Ben Jackson, a colleague at GRIP, wrote, quote, Tom was never understood by lots of people. He was very quiet, modest, and, as a friend of mine spoke of him, a gentle soul. He cared nothing for social life, but with one or two companions on a sketching and fishing trip with his pipe and Hudson Bay tobacco going, he was a delightful companion. If a party or the boys got a little loud or rough, Tom would get his sketching kit and wander off alone. At times, he liked to be that way, wanted to be by himself to commune with nature, end quote. He took a job as a fire ranger in the park and worked with a logging outfit in 1916, but found he was too busy with responsibilities to afford him the free time to paint and sketch. Late in the summer, he wrote, quote, I have done very little sketching this summer as the two jobs don't fit in. When we are traveling, two go together, one for canoe and the other to the pack. And there's no place for a sketch outfit when you're fire ranging. We're not fired yet, but I'm hoping to get put off right away. The next summer, 1917, Tom was determined to do some serious artistic work in the park. He thought it best to go out alone. His trip in early July 1917 would be his last. Why it ended up that way is still debated in some circles. More after a quick break. Okay, and we are back. Matthew... What are your thoughts so far about this uh, Tom Thompson character? You know, you've already known about him, obviously. I never knew about his death. Mm-hmm. Like it, th- this story never hit me. I only ever knew about his art. Interesting, it, and it seems that there are people like that. Like 
true crime people will know, uh, armchair detectives will know about his death, but they won't know a lot about his art. Yeah. But people who have jobs in which art is important and that is their interest, they'll have more of a knowledge. Of the art itself. Of the artist. That's, artist. that's and, my side, right? Yeah. Often an artist is more successful financially when he's dead, unfortunately. This is the case. Well, supply and demand, right? So, <laughs> so, so when the supply is suddenly gone, like, right. hey, I did five paintings, that's it. And they're good. Mm -hmm. Demand goes up when he's dead and supply is remaining the same. So, yeah. boom. In 1917, Tom Thompson seemed just on the cusp of success as a professional painter. He was looking forward to more time in Algonquin Park, where he felt he'd be able to get a lot of work done. And he hoped some would sell. One of Tom Thompson's last known correspondences came in a letter to one of his benefactors, Dr. James McCallum, dated July 7th, 1917, the day before he died. Thompson posted the letter from the Mowat Post Office near Canoe Lake. He wrote, Dear Sir, I am still around Fraser's and have not done any sketching since the flies started. The weather has been wet and cold all spring and the flies and mosquitoes much worse than I have seen them any year and the fly dope doesn't seem to have any effect on them. This, however, is the second warm day we've had this year and another day or so like this will finish them. We'll send my winter sketches down in a day or two and have every intention of making some more, but it has been almost impossible lately. Have done some guiding this spring, and we'll have some other trips this month and next, with probably sketching in between. Yours truly, Tom Thompson. It's here that things get hazy. The truth, as with many historical cases, is lost to time, as the participants and witnesses are no longer present to fill in the factual gaps. As well, the many retellings of the story and numerous subsequent investigations have also further obscured the true story and have created a dark mythology around the death of Tom Thompson. But who had the motive to kill him? One story that came to light in 1970, a full 53 years after Thompson's death, claims that the night before his fateful trip, Thompson spent time with friends drinking near Canoe Lake. The evening of heavy drinking allegedly came to an abrupt halt when Thompson and another man came to blows. It's not clear who, if anyone, Thompson fought with, but one of two men have been suggested. The first is Shannon Fraser, to whom Tom owed money. Apparently, though, these two got along well, so that fight isn't likely. The second man suggested as a co-combatant is a man named Martin Bletcher Jr., Bletcher was the owner of Mowat Lodge, a local guest house at which Thompson was staying. The row between Bletcher and Thompson is rumored to have started over Bletcher's supposed support of the Germans, who at the time were engaged with other Axis powers and fighting the Allies, of which Canada was a part, in World War I. It is said that Tom Thompson, a proud Canadian, took offense to Bletcher's ranting, and they briefly fought. Whether the fight occurred or not, the story of it has added to the mystique surrounding Thompson's death. Hmm, that is mysterious. Mm hmm. I wonder if Martin was related to Bob Belcher. Is Bletcher? Oh, you didn't spell that wrong? No, I didn't. Oh. <laughs> so you're talking about Bob Belcher from Bob's Burgers? Bob's Burgers. <laughs> oh, no. No. No? I'm fairly certain that they aren't related. I, I think you have better get back and start doing some more Yeah, research. I've got to, you know, upload their DNA, apparently, <laughs> to the... Oh, God. <laughs> more evidence that there had been no fight between Fraser and Thompson is that they were seen together the next morning, being jovial with each other. The pair were seen by three local witnesses, Park Ranger Mark Robinson, Mrs. Thomas, wife of the local railway section head, and Mrs. Colson the wife of the owner of the Hotel Algonquin on Joe Lake. Shannon Fraser and Thompson were carrying Fraser's boat and walking down to the Joe Lake Dam. As part of his duties as park ranger, Mark Robinson kept track of comings and goings on the lake. Robinson noted in his diary that Tom Thompson, quote, left Fraser's dock after 12.30 p.m. to go to T Lake Dam or West Lake, end quote. This is believed to be the last time anyone but an alleged killer saw Tom Thompson in his well-supplied canoe alive. It's unclear how long Thompson intended to be out and about. Just after 3 p.m. on the way to Tea Lake Dam, Martin Bletcher's wife and her brother noticed a canoe floating upturned in the lake between Staten's Point and Bertram Island. 
They didn't stop to examine the canoe as a canoe had drifted away from its moorings that morning and it had not been found. So they assumed that this was one and the same. On hearing of the canoe in the lake, Martin Bletcher felt that it was not significant and he didn't report it. It seems the upturned canoe was not investigated until Sunday, the 10th of July, a full two days after Thompson had left on his trip and only after he'd failed to return. It was Bletcher who raised the alarm at that point. He wanted rangers to drag Canoe Lake for Thompson's body. A friend of Thompson's sent a letter to Dr. James McCallum on July 12, 1917. It said, Dear Sir, Tom left here on Sunday about 1 o'clock for a fishing trip down the lake, and at 3 o'clock his canoe was found floating a short distance from my place, with both paddles tied tight in the canoe, also his provision were found packed in the canoe. The canoe was upside down. We can find no trace of where he landed or what happened to him. Everything is being done that can be done. His brother George arrived this morning and will let you know at once if we find him. Yours truly, J.S. Fraser. Fraser took George Thompson around the lake in search of Tom and they met several people and interviewed them, asking whether they'd seen Tom Thompson. No one had. Three park rangers along with Martin Bletcher also searched the shore of the lake and various portages without a result. I hated portaging as a kid. Well, no kidding, because it's heavy, heavy hated work. Hated it, because we always carried way too much stuff. The canoes, we, we made them ourselves, are actually quite heavy. Mm -hmm. And we did a lot of canoeing in Algonquin, and whenever we got to portage, was just, and it was the family. It was my mom and dad. And my brother and I, so like we all had to pitch in and we're little kids like trying to carry this bloody canoe. <laughs> so did you portage and do this kind of portage in this area? Were you around Canoe Lake? Yeah, we could very easily have hmm. been on the same sort of lakes and rivers that Tom Thompson was on. Cool. So for the next three days, park rangers and a small group of volunteers searched for Thompson without any luck. At around 9 a.m., eight days after he'd gone missing, a visiting cottage owner from Toronto, Dr. Goldwyn Howland, noticed something unusual floating in the lake off his place. His daughter had been fishing and snagged something heavy, and her fishing line had become tangled in it. Howland couldn't be sure, but he thought what the girl had caught on her line might be a human body. Oh, look, Daddy, I caught a famous Canadian artist. Oh, no. <laughs> well, it's one of a kind. If maybe the father was like more of a class assistant, said throw him back. Oh, no. But, you know, but how traumatizing for this little girl, though. <laughs> like, really. I bet you she never fished again. Well, yeah. Um, every time I fish, I catch a dead man. <laughs> oh, I catch God. dead people. <laughs> Don't hate us, folks. This happened a hundred years ago. <laughs> Howland directed guides George Rowe and Lowry Dixon to where he'd seen the body. Sure enough, it was a corpse. They retrieved it and brought it to shore. Later, Martin Bletcher Jr. and Mr. Hugh Trainer put a blanket over the body, and it remained there all day, through the night and into the next day, awaiting the arrival of the coroner. Although bloated and decomposed from a week in the water, the body was easily identified as that of Tom Thompson. Park Ranger Mark Robinson made notes of the proceedings that followed. On the morning of July 17, 1917, Dr. Ranny, the coroner from North Bay, arrived. The body was placed into a casket. At Mark Robinson's request, Dr. Howland, who discovered the corpse, did a cursory examination of it. Quote, we found a bruise on the left temple about four inches long, evidently caused by falling on a rock otherwise no marks of violence on the body, end quote. A later report indicated that when found, Thompson's body had a short length of fishing line wound around his ankle. It had either been cut or snapped. Much has been made of this fishing line over the years, however, very possibly this was from the rod of Howland's daughter, who'd caught the body. Some say it was Thompson's own fishing line and somehow contributed in tripping him during the incident that led to his death. Another theory claims that the line was used to tow Thompson's body to the shore by those who recovered it. The last theory, that is perhaps the most ludicrous, is that this line was used to hold the body underwater after his murder. Due to its badly deteriorated condition, Dr. Howland and the undertakers advised having the body buried immediately. 
A funeral was held at the small Canoe Lake Cemetery, with Mr. Martin Bletcher Sr. reading the funeral service while a few locals looked on. That evening, Dr. Ranny took the evidence of a few of the witnesses and determined the matter closed. Ranny determined that Tom Thompson had died in a tragic accident, having fallen out of his canoe. As it overturned, he assumed that Thompson had struck his head, knocking himself unconscious, subsequently drowning in the lake. Mark Robinson noted in his journal on July 18, 1917, quote, There is considerable adverse comment regarding the taking of evidence among the residents. End quote. As mentioned earlier, two days after the burial, George Thompson, Tom's older brother, had Tom's body exhumed and moved back to Leith, the home of Tom's childhood, where he was reburied. That was it. There was no more investigation. And the apparent lack of a thorough investigation has led to all kinds of crazy speculation over the years. Some of the investigators in the intervening 105 years since Thompson's death have pointed to the Bletcher story an initial lack of concern about the upturned canoe as suspicious. The failure to report the upturned canoe was not a typical practice. A few have considered it was cover for Thompson's alleged murder at Bletcher's hand or someone else's. Canadians love a good mystery. It was tough with so many unanswered questions to leave well enough alone. Canadians do love a good mystery. We do. We, lucky for us being yeah. in a true crime podcast. Yeah, funny how that works out. But, but why, why do we love a good mystery so much? And why are we so, like, uh, not negative, but, but like, love to, oh, oh, yeah, see what's, see what's going to happen? It's that small town mentality that right. Canadians have. Like, even though it's a, like, I've said it a billion times, even though it's a big country, we have, we still have this kind of small town way, that fort mentality that you mentioned yeah. before in dealing with things. And we, we, we tend to, I don't know, maybe be a little more suspicious of our neighbors than we should be. <laughs> we're, we're very kind. We're, we, we love them, but you, did you see what Marge was up to? <laughs> we're, we're curtain twitchers, I think. Yeah, I think we are a yeah. nation of curtain twitchers. Yeah. In 1935, after a years-long investigation, Bloden Davies published the first exploration of Tom Thompson's death outside of newspaper accounts from the time of Thompson's demise. A self-published edition of 500 copies detailed her doubts about the official decision of the cause of death sold poorly. On his blog, artist Alexander Adams wrote a detailed article about Thompson, his art, his death, and its aftermath. Investigations into the mystery of Tom Thompson's death sometimes went too far. Adams wrote, quote, Without permission in 1956, a group of men, including William Little, decided to excavate the Mowat Cemetery to settle the suspicion that Thompson's was not the body transferred to Leith. They did find a body with a skull that had a seeming bullet hole in the left temple. Forensic anthropologists concluded that the shape of the skull and dental characteristics suggested mongoloid, First Nations slash Indian, typology. Bones indicated a height of 5 foot 8 inches, Thompson was estimated to be 6 feet tall, aged 20 to 30, Thompson was almost 40, therefore the skeleton was not Thompson's. One doctor thought that the hole was the result of trepanning, not typical of a gunshot. No bullet was located in the skull, which had no exit wound. It seems impossible to believe that an experienced doctor such as Dr. Howland could have missed a bullet wound to the head, especially where the hair would have been short, end quote. Judge William Little released his book, The Tom Thompson Mystery, in 1970. In it, he details disturbing the grave at Canoe Lake. Canadian newspaper columnist Roy McGregor has described in his 2009 examination of records of the 1956 remains unearthed by William Little the remains have been reburied or lost, and concluded that the body was actually Thompson's, indicating, quote, that Thompson never left Canoe Lake. The plot thickens. Perhaps the best book written about the mystery is the one that seems to debunk that the mystery happened at all. In 2017, Gregory Clodges released his book, The Many Deaths of Tom Thompson, Separating Fact from Fiction, from CanadaHistory.ca. Quote, Cultural historian Gregory Clodges wrote, 
The difficulties inherent in answering the question, however, would make Thompson's death an increasingly compelling topic for speculation, conjecture, and gossip. The possibility that Thompson's death was due to unnatural causes, Clodges states, appealed to a typically Canadian romantic pessimism. Suggestions of murder or manslaughter, including high-profile works by journalist Roy McGregor in the 1970s and curator and art historian Joan Murray in the late 1980s, grabbed the public imagination. Clodges concentrates on primary documents, some of which have become available only in the last 15 years, and on contemporary witness accounts, casting a skeptical eye on the often dramatic versions of events that circulated for decades after Thompson's death. The author is wary of the potential pitfalls of oral history, especially when it involves distant memories or local rumors, and he is particularly hard on the, quote, sloppy use of untrustworthy evidence, which can enter into written accounts and eventually come to be seen as the truth through dint of repetition. This detailed takedown sometimes makes for dry reading, but then met meticulously dismantling a historical myth is never quite as glamorous as building one up. Clodges himself occasionally resorts to discussing the plausible rather than the proven, using phrases such as, it is entirely possible that, in general, however, he hews very close to the known facts, and even more crucially, he is clear about what he doesn't know. Quote, no amount of research is going to offer a definitive solution, he admits, end quote. Perhaps this case is where the application of the law of economy, or law of parsimony, also known as Occam's razor, is worth a look. The 14th century scholastic philosopher William of Occam stated that, quote, plurality should not be posited without necessity. More simply put, the simplest solution is almost always the best answer. That with that in mind, it is most likely that, like the initial investigation concluded, Tom Thompson fell in, bonked his head, and drowned. Not very romantic, but most likely what happened. Tom Thompson was a typical Canadian, almost a model for the stereotype we now know so well. Perhaps this is why his life, art, and the circumstances of his untimely death have been such a popular topic for so long. Regardless, Tom Thompson died in a place that he loved. And that is it for Dark Poutine episode 244. What happened to Tom Thompson? What do you think happened to Tom Thompson, Matthew? I think he slipped and hit his head and drowned. Yeah, that's what I think too. Right? And I don't think there was any murder. No, it's, it's you know, he was, a, he was an up and coming, well, he was getting quite famous artist. And I think just the rumor mill started and sure. it created an entire industry. Yeah, I, I I think the lack of uh, investigation at first is a big part of what may have driven that rumor mill early on. Like, I mean, yeah, yeah, but it's they just, it's nineteen. They found him and they threw him in the ground. It's nineteen seventeen, and he was canoeing alone in Algonquin Park. I mean, it was it's dangerous now, Algonquin Park, right? Yeah, if you don't know what you're doing, and he, he and it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, he died. So there's there's been arguments that he was an expert uh, canoeer, and then there are people who say, well, actually, he kind of wasn't. <laughs> so, of course he wasn't. He was an artist. Yeah. And, but as Canadians, we're all generally expert canoers. Yeah, right. Yeah, we're born with a canoe paddle in our hands. It's true. Yeah, yeah. And, and a knowledge of what each animal well, is. Well, I was. You were born with a, with, um, a yacht in your hand. <laughs> <laughs> a yacht. It's true. Sure, you had a proper yacht. We had homemade canoes. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> well, I don't have a yacht now. No. No. Yacht? Not. I, I, there is not a yacht. There is not a yacht. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1 877 327 5786 or 1 877 DARK PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. Look at that. It is time for voicemails. Let's listen to these voicemails. It, it could be we had some interesting ones this week. One may be from uh, elsewhere in the world. I don't know. It, hmm. But anyway, let's listen to the first one. I think this one's from either Nova Scotia or PEI. Hi, Mike and Matthew. <laughs> I'm dying laughing at you guys. <laughs> My name is Megan. I'm from the East Coast. 
Um, I was laughing over the benign dictatorship. It's like, ever. <laughs> and as for the Trailer Park Boys, they are pretty good. Nothing wrong with the Trailer Park Boys. I've seen Bubbles singing his song. It's pretty awesome. But talking about this type of show, like these type of shows, I haven't seen Letter Kenny. I would like to see that at some point. I just haven't watched it yet. And sure, there is one called Moonshiner or Moonshine. It's on Netflix, and it's based out of the south shore, like the south of Nova Scotia, like the South Shore. It's hilarious. It is so friggin' funny. I friggin' love it, and I'd recommend it to anybody because it's it's a hoot. It's just one of those. It shows what small towns are like, and it's funny, and yeah, and I had to share, and to tell you guys I love you, and and bye. <laughs> so, so her phone was breaking up a bit, but I'm pretty sure she told us to go shit in her hat I at the end of that. Did. But moonshiners, I I don't know about this, and it's from my neck of the woods, which is bizarre. So how do I not know about this play, this show? So. I'm going to watch. She hasn't watched Letterkenny. She loves some Trailer Park Boys. But uh, but yeah, I, I love that Nova Scotia accent too. Do you want to know something funny? What? I've been working with a woman for two years. Mm-hmm. And the, only this Friday did I realize that she's not from Ireland. <laughs> Where's she from? Halifax. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Two years, I thought she was Irish. Yeah, it took me a, a little while to sort of work that twang, that drawl out of my voice, and I still kind of have it every now and again. It's it's not a hundred percent gone. I think you can take the boy out of Nova Scotia, but get, can't take the Nova Scotia out of the boy. Did you just go to the bar often. The, the, the bar. I went to the bar and parked the car. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But I mean, there's there's Irish heritage, and it carried on. But yep. yeah, I was so embarrassed. I was like, I'm like, where were you? From? Like, what town did you grow up in? She's like Halifax, and and I'm like, but I aren't you Irish? She's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> But back to Megan's voicemail, she mentions benign dictatorship in uh, in her her first opening there. And to find out what that means, you have to call the show because I make a little announcement about a benign dictatorship at the beginning in my in my uh, voice message at the beginning of the. Yeah. Oh, is that where she she got it from? Yes, yeah. I've never called in. Well, you should. <laughs> Let's listen to another voicemail here. Hello, boys. My name is Anis, and I'm calling you from Cairns, West. Uh, actually, I'm not in West Australia. I'm in Queensland. Australians don't know up from down. Hey, just wanted to let you guys know that um, I'm loving your show. I take it on a walk with me when I take my dogs for a walk and just generally around the house. And uh, I promise I will do the take on thing when I get a paid job, which I promise to do. Okay, thanks. Bye. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. So uh, we had a nice lady call us from Australia. Queensland. Yes. Um, I have never been to Australia. You have? Many times. Yeah, see, I, I just have to say, hey, Matthew, you were, you were here. I even don't. I didn't even know that that was the truth until I, you know, until you, I didn't even know that was the truth that you'd been there. But However, you assumed I did. I just assumed that I'm you'd old. been everywhere. Been... No, it's not that you're old. You're just well traveled. True. Yes. So we hope you decide to get a job. Someday. A paid job. <laughs> Like, hey, you know what? If mate? you don't need a paid job, yeah. Then... Sometimes I don't. I wish I didn't have a paid job, but then other times I wish I had a paid job. Yeah. Because I actually love my job, but some days you're like, hey, it'd be great just to be a lady of leisure. A lady of leisure? Yes. You're a kept woman? <laughs> Are you a kept man? Uh, uh, no. No, you're definitely Unfortunately. not. Unfortunately. Well, actually, no, that would drive me crazy. Yeah, probably. Because yeah. you have no agency as a human being. No. And it's I'm... like everything you do has to be in service of some twit. <laughs> Yuck. That's it for this week's voicemails. 
Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 877 We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. On to Patreon, and we had a few patrons this week. I'm so happy that we had, that we're going in, uh, you know, we, we kind of hover around a certain number, but you know, we've been losing some patrons, which is interesting. But we're picking some up now. But we're picking some up. Your love is patreonic. Yeah. But we, we all know that, you know. Not everyone's a kept yeah, woman. Not everyone Patreon. is a kept woman who can afford Patreon. Or a so. kept man. Or a kept man. <laughs> or a kept anything. Yes. <laughs> like my, my cats are kept cats. <laughs> All pets are kept pets. Well, they rule the roost. Yeah. Steve definitely rules your roost. Oh, he? yeah. Yeah. He was barking. At, I was trying to have a nap in the afternoon. Yeah. And he figured it was getting close to dinner time. I'm never in bed at that time of the day. So he came over and barked. Oh, no. To get me up. Because usually I'm cooking in the kitchen at that point. What are you doing, Matthew? What are you doing? Why are you laying there? What are you doing? That's exactly what he was doing. Yeah. There should be food getting ready. There you go. So let's move on to our patrons here. We have Sarah Harrison first up. And she is from St. Ferial La Neige. In Quebec. Something of the snow. Something of the snow. saint ferriol le neige So, yes, I don't know what that means or who saint Ferriol is or was or anything like that. But uh, what does Sarah Harrison do there in Quebec? She's an art appraiser. Oh, she appraises art. Well, that's yes. appropriate for this particular show. Yeah, she specializes in Fauvist paintings. Fauvist? Yeah, the Fauvist. Like, are they fake vistas? Faux vists? <laughs> what? You're hilarious. Well, I don't know. I don't know what a faux vist is. Look it up. Why should I look it up? You should tell Anyway, me. that's what she does. Okay. Yeah. I'll look it up. I'll look it up later. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we have from Powell River, British Columbia, our friends over in Powell River, our... Uh, Xander James Clark. Xander James Clark from Powell River. What does Xander do there in Powell River, Matthew? Xander? Yes. He's retired since he finished Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh, well, the, oh wow. Yeah. So we, we have like a vampire slayer. Yeah. Or, or wasn't Xander one of the vampires? No, Xander was one of the... Xander was the goofy friend. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> Poor Buffy. <laughs> Sarah Michelle Geller. What happened to her? Where did uh, she go? Retired. I guess so. Wouldn't, wouldn't you? She retired on her Buffy money. Yeah. Yeah, well, good for her. This is Buffy cash, bitches. There you go. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, next up, we have from Juneau, Alaska, MJ Hinman. MJ Hinman from Juneau, Alaska. I don't know where, what they do for a living up there in Juneau, but what is it that MJ does? Works at a department store called Grace Brothers. Grace Bro, How do you know this? Do you, have you been to Juneau? No. Okay. So what is Grace Brothers? A department store. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so Matthew, uh, it, is it an actual thing in Juneau, Alaska? No. Have you ever seen Are You Being Served? Yes. That's Grace Brothers. Oh, is it? Store. Oh, I haven't seen that show in a long time, but I loved it. With Mrs. Slocum's pussy. <laughs> yes. I love that. It's humor. been a long time since I've thought about Mrs. Slocum's pussy. We we watched it last night. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah. What what's it on? What's it streaming on? Uh, Bitbox. Oh, there you go. Yeah, other streaming services available. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I did your job. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, uh, that is it for patrons. Thanks, folks. Thank you, guys. Yeah, there will be donut money next week. How do I know? Because we're recording another episode, and we're you. saving that donut money for <laughs> yeah. next week. Exactly. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors past and present for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. 
You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash dark poutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And that is it for Dark Poutine episode 244. The What happened to Tom Thompson? Thanks for joining us, folks. We love you. We love you to bits. We do. Yeah. Thanks for being good eggs because we know you're not bad apples. Do you know Matisse? Matisse, yes, I know Matisse. He's a phobist. Okay, there you go. Now I know what a phobist is. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Oh, yeah, yeah. Don't forget to be a good egg. Not a bad apple. Bye. Oh, oh yeah. Don't forget that thing. Okay. Bye. <laughs>